John he yelled at us. You uh, know we're here. I guess I can give up a sticky note. There you go. What's a sticky note? Okay. Yeah, we're doing an activity. Luckily, I got three. I got three. I got three. started. Um, I'd like to welcome you uh, to our presentation uh, by Sherry Davis of the Participatory Budgeting Project. Uh, my name is uh, John West. I'm an urban planning professor here at Ball State. And um, we invited Sherry to come here and talk about participatory budgeting. Uh, Sherry is the co-executive director for the Participatory Budgeting Project. She just got a promotion to that uh, title. So we're all excited. Um, so the Participatory Budgeting Project uh, was recognized by the White House under President Obama in 2015 as a model for civic engagement. Um, it was awarded Harvard University's Innovations in American Government Award in 2015 as well. Um, Sherry has worked as an organizer of participatory budgeting processes across the country, and especially in Boston and California. Uh, she joined the Participatory Budgeting Project staff after nearly 15 years of service in local government. Uh, she first became involved in city government in high school. Uh, she was the citywide neighborhood safety coordinator on the Boston Mayor's Youth Council and working on the Boston Mayor's Youth Council. Uh, she also worked with the Mayor's Youth Line. She became the Director of Youth Engagement and Employment for the City of Boston. She also uh, launched Youth Lead the Change, the first, first youth participatory budgeting process in the United States, which won the U.S. Conference of Mayors City Liv Livability Award. Uh, she's a graduate of Boston University Sargent College for Health and Rehabilitation Sciences, and she holds a master's degree in anatomy and physiology. Uh, I'm really excited to have Sherry here, and she has some great uh, stuff planned for us. There's just a, a few other things I wanted to say before I turn the mic over. Um, I wanted to uh, thank the College of Architecture and Planning, and especially uh, Dave Ferguson, uh, for helping to put this together. I wanted to also thank the Office of Community Engagement uh, and Delana Boyd and Aaron Moore, who are also here. Hello. And uh, the Department of Planning also is sponsoring uh, this project, especially uh, I want to thank Michal Pereira, our chair, and uh, Trevor Preddy, who uh, went down to Indianapolis and picked Sherry up. And uh, I'd like to thank Christine Ryan, who's always invaluable in these kinds of situations. Finally, uh, I wanted to invite you to stay after the talk. At 5.30, we're going to order some pizza and have a little bit of a more discussion uh, with Sherry. So you're all welcome to stay and uh, dine with us. Um, and with that, I'm going to turn it over to Sherry. Thanks, John. Thanks so much for having 
So again, my name is Sherry Davis. I'm the incoming co-executive director of the Participatory Budgeting Project. And that means that PBP, my organization, is becoming a black-led organization. And that's something I'm really excited about. I'm thrilled to be here. Guys, make some more noise for Trevor to make sure that I got here today. <laughs> And let me warn you about a couple things. We're going to do a lot of clapping, so please get ready for that. Um, we're also going to talk to each other. I'm going to talk to you guys for just a couple minutes, but I want you to experience what I do for a living, and that is participatory budgeting. So we are going to do a little bit of time travel and a rapid fire um, example of what PB looks like. So get ready to move around and talk to each other. And I want to say that again, prepare to move around now. So if you need to tie up your sneakers, it's now the time to do that. Um, a couple of super quick things. Um, we are going to do, before I even start talking and tell you about participatory budgeting, I hope that everybody got a couple uh, post-it notes. You should have a couple pink or red ones and a couple blue ones. If you're missing some, raise your hand and someone will help you out. There's a hand up. Look at all these hands. Someone's going to help you out. Someone has these post-it notes in this room somewhere. Just leave your hand up for half a second, and we're going to make sure that you guys get some. If you have a stack of post-it notes in front of you, this is the time to pass them around. Perfect. They're coming. Don't worry. All right. So the first thing I want you guys to do is actually stand up. I warned you. Now, before we start this first activity, so that I don't have to like yell at you all, I'm going to use a really easy facilitation technique. When you see me put a hand up like this, you should put your hand up and stop talking. So let's try this out. Find a partner, give them a high five. Say hi and tell them why you came out tonight. cheating if you put your hand up and you kept talking, right? So as soon as you see hands go up, you have to stop talking. Good job. Make some noise for yourselves. You did a good job there. So now, we're going to start talking about those post-its. I have Amy right behind you. If you turn around, you'll see I have a flip chart paper that tells people what those post-its are. So if you pull down the red pin, I think, it'll give some instructions. And that'll remind me what you guys are supposed to do. Nope, wrong. Yep, that's the right one. Perfect. So, you guys see these beautiful maps of Muncie all over the room, right? You see those? They're on some flip chart paper. We had an artist come in and draw those for you guys. They did a ton of work on those. So, with your pink post-it, when I tell you to, you're going to find another partner, not the person you just gave a high five to. And you're going to talk about the things that are in this community across the city that you really love. And you're going to think about what you like about them. You might say, I really love the library in X place because it has a video game station and I get to go in there and play video games, for example. You're going to write that on your pink post-it note and you're going to go up and put that on the map exactly where that item is. Don't worry about putting it on the map yet. The first thing that you guys are going to do is start talking with the person that you pair up with about the things that you love. I want you to come up with at least two things that you can place on this map. And if you have more, we're going to find you some more paint posts to know. Does that sound OK? Thumbs up if it sounds OK. All right, there's a lot of participation here, so get ready. All right, find a new partner, give them a high five, and start talking about what you really like. <laughs>
students downtown. Uh, no, a lot of them, I had one student that was supposed to go to Project Wetland, and he like put it in his phone and found something like way out here or something in like five or whatever it was. Give your partner a high five, tell them thank you. All right. So, if you guys came up with some things that you really like about Muncie, which I hope you did when you were talking to your partner, in a moment, you're going to throw those up on the map. Just hold on to those pink post-its for just a second. If you already beat me to the map, that's okay. You're ahead of the game. Now we're going to talk about those blue post-it notes that you have. The blue post-its are the things that you think maybe could be a little bit better. Blue post-its look like some shade of this. Um, things that you think could maybe be a little bit better. It's something that could say, I wish there was X here, or it would be great if we could fix this. Those are some examples. So now, find a new partner and give them a high five. And now let's talk about the improvements. Give me at least two. Once you're done, put them up on the map. about things that you really like and you were able to think about things that maybe are not here yet that you would love to see maybe some improvements that you would really appreciate I had a chance to talk to some of you guys and some folks said 
Ooh, I haven't been here that long. I'm just a student here. But you do spend time here. So from a person that is here for just a couple months to a person that's been here their whole lives, I think you guys are going to notice that there are some commonalities with what you recognize and what you'd really like to see in this space. So this is going to become really relevant in just a moment. We're not done with these post-its and the work that you guys did here. We're going to talk about that in just a second. But before we do, I want to tell you a little bit more about what I'm here to talk about, and that is participatory budgeting. I'm not used to standing behind a desk. I'm like a walker, so you guys are going to have to deal with me and like if I look a little antsy. Um, so as John mentioned, I come from the Participatory Budgeting Project. This is a really good slide to take a picture of. If you ever want to find out more about PBP or our organization, there's a lot of information here, including our like website and Twitter handle. Um, PB in the United States, and forgive me guys, I will say PB, participatory budgeting, is a mouthful, um, so I hope that's okay. Uh, PB in the United States is relatively new. As you can see, the first example of participatory budgeting was in 2009, and that's when PBP as an organization came together to help launch a process in Chicago. We were incorporated in 2011. We've done a lot of work across North America in the last 10 years, um, and we have one mission, and that mission is to help people decide together how to spend public money. And so, when we talk about participation, there are a lot of things. Uh, I've worked in cities and communities that say they have a community engagement plan or a participation plan, but how we talk about engagement and participation is a little bit different. Sometimes, and what I see mostly, is that folks have an opportunity to listen a lot when we're talking about government engagement. Has anyone here been to a hearing or council meeting that they had and they listened in the back? Great. So that's awesome because you get informed, you learn things, but you don't have an opportunity necessarily to have your voice heard or to point to how your participation in that hearing is going to end up uh, resulting in change in community. So if we start marching up this ladder, we see other things like really cool online games that allow us to learn more things. Maybe there's a slider where I can determine a fictional exercise and understand if I adjust a budget this way how it would impact X Y or Z it's fun I learn a lot it's important but I still can't point to how that changes community when I interact with that thing the next thing that I see all of the time is that we ask community members to be consultants we say we want your feedback constantly I'm a recovering government employee I worked in government for nearly 15 years. And shout out to all the government employees, you're awesome. It's crazy hard work. As a government employee, I asked folks for their feedback constantly. And I was able to use that in really helpful ways to make decisions when it came to my job. But I wasn't able necessarily always to take that feedback and allow someone to point to how that influenced my decision. It was really hard to allow uh, or to create a system that tracked that input so that I can give feedback to the folks that um, provided it. So we ask community to be consultants all the time. And then there's this really cool thing. Some people end up serving on a board or council. This is great. Now folks can make decisions. They can actually point to what their decisions were and how that has affected community. The challenge here is that if I put everyone in this room on one council, it would kind of be hard to navigate be a ton of folks. Most councils have between 10 and 30 people. So what happens to everybody else? How do we make sure that everyone gets to participate? We describe that as full participation. Participatory budgeting is one example of what full participation looks like. So as we think about this ladder, I want you guys to ask yourself this question. Where do you typically stand? Are you a person that gets to listen, are you a person that serves on a board or council, or have you had a chance to engage in a full participation process? And if you've had a chance to do those things, that's great, but where do you normally stand on that ladder? The second thing I want you to think about is your friends, your neighbors, your classmates, and other folks you know in community. Where do they normally stand? And they're not all standing at the same place. So I mentioned to you what participatory budgeting is. 
It's absolutely a democratic process that allows community members to directly decide how to spend a portion of a public budget. So I'm going to stop talking for a second and show you guys a super quick video that I heard a few of you may have already seen. So now is the time to pull out your popcorn because this is going to be good. Can you guys hear this okay? It's a little quiet, isn't it? Can I get some volume help up here, maybe? This. Sorry, y'all. I was trying to get through this without any technical difficulties. I'm almost there. Power over real money to make the decisions that affect their lives. It's a democratic process in which ordinary community members directly decide how to spend a part of the public budget. Oh, this is different because you're actually voting for where the money is going to be spent instead of allowing them to decide where to spend the money. Who knows better about their community than the people that live in their community? Do not be afraid of the big words, participatory budgeting. It sounds boring, but it's the opposite of that. So how does it work? First, people brainstorm ideas. They come together in meetings and assemblies and start to think of what kinds of projects they would like to see in their neighborhood. We had to think big. We have a million dollars that we could use so we can fund parks, health issues, streets. Volunteers work with experts to turn people's initial ideas into full project proposals. We started with maybe about 40 projects, and so we had a series of budget delegate meetings, and we narrowed down the list into about four or five projects. We met with the Parks Department, and we talked about what we wanted to see change in some of the parks and how we were going to work with them. What are the real needs in the community? If you only have a certain amount of money, what is it that you can do that's going to benefit as many people as possible? I'm dreaming of new benches, modern benches. Seniors have nowhere to go. Displays at bus shelters throughout the district, and it will tell people when the next bus is due to arrive. We're asking for a projector and 30 Mac laptops. State of the art fitness center. To put solar panels on a firehouse. After volunteers share the top projects, the community gets ready to vote. It's a way of validating every voice in our community and saying, you know what, whatever your position is, you live in our community, you have a right to decide. And that me as a representative and government should respond and should listen to that voice. Anybody can vote in this process, immigrants, whether you're documented or not, you know, people that normally don't get to vote. Most people, they don't even know that six CEOs can come out here and vote today. Some of them are really surprised. They say, really? I said, yes. They have a voice. projects with the most votes get funded. The Red Hook Library Community Garden. Yeah. Right here. The projects are then implemented over the next few years. And the following year, the process starts again. People brainstorm new ideas, turn them into new projects, vote on them, and fund more improvements for their community. PB becomes part of the budget process. It becomes a new way of governing. I think this is like the greatest wave of democracy coming into the United States. It started in Porto Alegre, Brazil in 1989. From there, it spread all over Latin America to over 1,500 cities around the world. In Toronto, public housing tenants have decided how to spend millions of dollars on improvements to their buildings. City council members in Chicago, New York, and other cities have engaged thousands of residents in allocating discretionary funds. Entire cities have launched PV, such as in Vallejo, California, for funds from a sales tax and in Boston for youth funds. Even schools and universities have used PD. This was a great opportunity for you to be a part of government and better the city you live in. Who wouldn't want to take advantage of that? You're creating a more educated platform of voters overall. So I think this can only be good for the big project of democracy. Able to hear me perfect. All right, 
So, my mic might be a little too loud. Okay. Maybe that's good. Is that all right, y'all? All right, cool. Um, give me one second to figure out why my slides aren't all the way up. But in the meantime, while I keep going here, just to summarize a couple things. So, participatory budgeting works like this. We see folks come together first. And what you didn't see in that video was before we actually jump into a participatory budgeting process, a steering committee is built. The job of the steering committee is to write the rules that govern a PD process. Steering committee members are not a typical committee that I've seen in government. In the city of Boston, for example, a steering committee consisted mostly of teenagers that wrote the rules that govern the really um, process that could, could be seen as complicated. They made really smart decisions and they thought about the folks that they wanted to engage. And so we had some goals in Boston and it was to engage folks that are maybe involved in the court system. It was to engage people that are normally left out of a process. So we had to go to where they were, but also make sure that they were represented on the steering committee. After we do those things, now it's time to step out into the community with the steering committee's guidance. So part of what they do is determine where we need to be and how we need to have conversations. So rather than um, saying everyone needs to come to me to suggest an idea on how to make community better, we go to where they are and have idea collection assemblies. Um, sometimes that happens over the course of a month where we have stations set up outside of a football game, at universities and schools, but really wherever community members say we need to be in order to have conversations with folks that are normally left out of a process like this. After we do idea collection, we may collect hundreds if not thousands of ideas, and then we move in to my favorite part of a PD process, which is proposal development. We take those ideas, we think about them with a matrix of need, feasibility and impact, and it forces folks to think outside of what they're accustomed to and maybe what their personal needs are, and really think about the needs of the broader community. We use that to determine, again, what's feasible, needed, and is going to have the greatest impact in community, and we sit alongside staff members to price what could happen. Nothing makes it onto a ballot in the PD process unless it's actually going to be carried out if it's voted on by community. So that means we have to think about eligibility based on where funding comes from and a few other criteria. Once we're able to develop those proposals, attach price tags onto them, now we're able to make a ballot. That ballot goes out in community and it's not like a normal uh, local or national election. Typically, voting doesn't just take place on one day. And we bring those ballots out to where folks are, very similar to what I described in the idea collection phase of this process. Usually voting can take one to two weeks. We collect as many votes as we possibly can. And then my second favorite part, uh, debatably my favorite, is when we get to implement projects into community. And community members can point and say, that is the thing that I voted on, and this is the improvement from a PD process. One of the big things about PD that's incredibly important to me and all of us at PDP, the Participatory Budgeting Project, is that we're able to ensure equity and inclusion. There are a few things that we do in order to make that happen, but the first is we don't talk about a PD process with $500. We have to talk about money that matters. And so sometimes that's a sizable amount of money, but also thinking about where it comes from in the budget. So for example, in the city of Boston, there was a million dollars for folks to use in the participatory budgeting process. The Boston process was a youth-focused process. Young people between 12 and 25 decided on a million dollars of the capital budget. So that's infrastructure, right? And it was a sizable amount of money so that they could actually see projects come out of that. It would be hard to do that with a couple thousand dollars. If we're talking about doing PD, we have to think about what fu funding is available and what projects would be eligible for that funding and make sure that it's not just a trivial case of community members deciding how to spend a couple dollars. The other thing that is essential for a process like this to work is that we have to have grassroots leadership. And so that looks like members of community-based organizations that not only serve on the steering committee, 
but really become the ambassadors of a PD process. This, this is not a process where city staff and city staff solely are running it. This is a process that's run by community. So we have to have community leaders involved. With that said, if we want to have young people participate in a process, maybe we shouldn't have meetings at 10 a.m. on a Tuesday when they're in school. And if we're going to have broader community participate in a process, well, maybe we need to think about what child care looks like at a meeting for a single parent. And that work has to happen right at the beginning. And that's essential if we're talking about designing a process that includes people, especially those that are normally left out. Speaking of people that are normally left out, if we want them to show up, we have to focus our outreach to make sure that they have the information and can be in attendance. And so we have to name what those populations are and really be intentional about how we bring them into the conversation. And then last but not least, when I do this work, and I've done this work all over the country, equity criteria in a community is important, and it changes. I mentioned before need, feasibility, and impact. That's where we start at PDP, but when we get into a community, we really talk about what equity looks like on the ground in that space. And so I mentioned that we've done this work in a lot of communities across the country. Some of those are listed here, but this map is a bit outdated at this point because there's even more PD processes happening across the country now. I'll run through just a couple, and then I want to actually allow you guys to go through a PD process in this room together. One of the biggest examples of PD that I think is really cool happened, happens in Toronto, and it's one of the longest examples of PD in North America. It happens in a housing community where over 160,000 tenants come together to make decisions on nearly $10 million of funds, capital funds, every year. In Vallejo, California, this is an interesting case of participatory budgeting, particularly because PB came when Vallejo went bankrupt. They instituted a sales tax measure that raised over $3 million in its first year, and they said community members have the opportunity to directly decide how that funding is spent each year. And Vallejo still continues to go through a PD process, and we see thousands of residents engaged in that, and we've seen way more than 12 projects funded to date. I can't really talk about PD without mentioning New York City. Um, New York City, obviously, is super different than very small Vallejo in California, but is the largest example of PB in the United States. And now this is out of date too. We have way more than 28 districts. We are in over 30 districts that are involved in participatory budgeting. And there's a little bit of healthy competition. If we're seeing a counselor in District 39 that's doing PB, now the counselor in District 37 is really asking themselves, why am I not doing PB? Usually because their community is knocking out the door and saying, how can we make decisions together? This is not a process where we're talking about uh, elected officials making zero decisions, but really, how do we make better decisions together, understanding what community needs are, and really being able to build that into a process like this. I've talked about Boston a lot. I tend to do that. Um, and I'll just mention maybe one of my favorite things about the Boston process was I thought I broke it once. And let me tell you how PB came into my life. Uh, John mentioned this when he gave my introduction, but I started in government as a teenager. He mentioned that I was in government for 15 years. I just turned 30 a couple months ago. And being able to be engaged from that young age, I believed always that people should listen to me. The mayor of Boston taught me that. He started listening to me when I was nearly 14 years old. And because of that practice, I thought that everyone in the city should listen to other young people. So during my tenure in the city, I started off doing regular admin work. And then I kept coming back. I used to joke that they just couldn't get rid of me. And I found myself overseeing the programs that I was involved in as a child and having an opportunity to redesign them. John mentioned I oversaw a division in government. That division didn't exist when I started in government. I created it. And that's when the mayor said, great, now that you've done this, 
run a youth PD process. It's never happened in the country before, but I want it to happen in the city of Boston. I had no idea what participatory budgeting was. That's when I met our partner, my partner, the other co-director of PD. He explained it to me, and it took me some time to really get it. But when it sunk in, I thought it was incredibly transformative because it wasn't a select few young people that had a chance to have a say, but really a broad array. And that was the difference for me. Now, let me tell you about how I thought I broke PB after I explained all of that good stuff. So one of the projects that came up in the city of Boston was a park renovation. And it was great. Folks were really excited about it. Young people voted to have accessibility structures put into a park so that it would be more inclusive. Excellent. We're getting ready to break ground. The shovels come out. And then we had to halt construction because we found out that it was on top of an archaeological historical site. So now I'm like, great. I told you before, nothing makes it onto the ballot unless it's actually going to happen in community. And so now I've ruined PB in Boston, and everything is going to be terrible. Panicked. I started talking to the city's archaeologist, and rather than doing business as usual, he decided, let's have a community archaeological dig. We'll invite all community members to participate. They found artifacts, extended Boston's history, and then renovated the park. So not only did we get a park renovation, but we had an entire experience where community members had a chance to learn things, be involved in a process, and do something that they had never done before. A couple of other really quick examples that I just wanted to lift up is that PBP, we're seeing a huge shift towards participatory budgeting in schools. And that is important for us because we're talking about building capacity for young leaders, leaders that are very much going to be in charge of our democracy. And so how do we build pipelines toward lifelong civic engagement? Participatory budgeting for us has been a huge answer. I actually just got off the plane yesterday from Phoenix, Arizona, where I led a conference that brought 250 people from across the world together to talk about innovations and in participatory democracy. So PB and also other awesome innovations and in how we solve making our systems and government more democratic. One of the things that was really cool is we started this conference at a high school, Central High School in Phoenix, Arizona. Central High School is a large school, but they started PB in Phoenix with just one school. Then it's five, now it's 10. Next year it'll be the entire district. And young people are deciding how portions of the school district's budget is spent. Not only are we seeing that in Phoenix, but San Jose, Chicago, Sacramento, Oakland, California, and a few other places. And PB as a process has been recognized in a few different ways. So from an, a federal government standpoint, it's been named as a best practice for engagement. Um, we've seen this take place when we're talking about community development block grant funds, especially in Oakland, California, which was the first example of a PB process that allows community members to directly decide on how community development block grant funds would be spent. Now, these are funds that are designed for low-income communities. Low-income communities often have other people make decisions for them. This was groundbreaking because that changed how this happens drastically. And so why do we talk about doing this? The impacts of PB are huge. In Vallejo, California, one in five people that participated in the PB vote were ineligible to vote in local and national elections. Maybe it's because they were under 18, or maybe there's another barrier for their participation. But that barrier did not exist in the PB process. In New York City, we're seeing higher, exam higher participation from those that come from low-income backgrounds as compared to regular local and national elections. So again, People that are normally left out of a process like this are able to engage. But what happens to a 16-year-old that directly decides how to spend a portion of a budget or someone else, right, maybe a single parent that has never engaged in government before, decides how a portion of the budget is spent? What's their likelihood now to vote in the local and national election? Again, we're talking about building pathways towards lifelong civic engagement. And that has to happen between election day, right? Participation can't just happen only on election day. 
Harvard University did a study on participatory budgeting in Boston, and one of the cool things that came out of it was that participants reported a few things. Being more likely to step into a city-owned building, period. There were folks that wouldn't have stepped into a city-owned building before, and because of this process had and are likely to come back. Folks report being more likely to participate in volunteering in their community, getting engaged with a community-based organization, and even being more likely to participate or run for office themselves. And so again, we're talking about engaging people in a process that changes the way that they think about government, but also the way that they participate and interact with it. This allows us to build stronger relationships between government, community-based organizations, and the people that live in communities. But it also allows people to see government in a totally different light, as a real asset that they can engage with and navigate to see real change in community, not us just talking about potential changes. Ultimately, we do all of this so that we can see more equitable and effective spending. So that now I understand community spending priorities. Community members understand what the process is in order to actually spend money in government. There are a few steps. There are rules, RFPs go out. There are various and sundry things. But now a community member really knows what that process is, understands how to navigate and interact with it. And so that's all the talking that I'm going to do right now about participatory budgeting. Because I want to give you guys a chance to see it live in action and to engage with the process on your own. And so we're going to go through a hyper fast PB experience here. This will feel a little bit different, obviously, than a normal PB process because what we're going to do now is in the next mm, 40 minutes or so, go through a process that normally takes community members between four and eight months to complete. So you guys are going to definitely have your work cut out for you. I hope you're ready for that. The first thing that I asked you guys to do today when we were starting to get to know each other was to come up with some ideas. You came up with things that you love in your community, and you came up with things that maybe you wish were here, maybe things that you wish were improved or a little bit different. So in a few minutes, I'm going to have you guys break up into a couple groups, and I'm going to think about the way to do that without creating immense chaos in this room. And you guys are going to do a few things. You're going to... We're going to pretend in this instance that we've already completed idea collection, that we've already went out and collected a bunch of ideas. Some of those ideas are right here around the room. And now we're going to step into the proposal development phase of our PB process here. We are going to use a million dollars of the city's budget in our exercise. Now, there are some things that I want to explain just so that we don't get confused. I mentioned Boston and I mentioned capital funds. So that was infrastructure only. They could not have any ongoing costs or programs and services in their process. For the purpose of our exercise today, you guys will be able to suggest ideas that have infrastructure impacts. So it could be a road or elements or something like that, a brick and mortar thing that you can touch. or it could be a program or service that has an ongoing cost, but we'll have to identify that. So if you have a project that you want to suggest, and it is to hire more staff at the library, we're going to have to think about that as hire more staff for two years, right? So I can get really specific on the cost there. And we'll talk about that in just a moment. So what I'd like to do is everybody that's in a row on this side, you guys are going to form groups of about mm, six or so. So we'll kind of combine two rows together. So I see like a group of five right here. You guys will be one group. And look around in your row. You guys are going to form a couple groups. Folks that are in the back, I'm going to actually create four groups back here. And I'm going to get you guys situated in the front in just a second. But the folks that are in the back, I'm going to have group one is you guys. Group two is you folks in the back. Group three is going to be you folks right here. And group four, you guys are together. My fifth group is right here. You guys are group five. My sixth group is right here. You all are group six. My seventh group is right here. You guys are group seven. And you all are lucky number eight. So does everyone understand which group they're in? You guys can talk to me. Does everybody understand which group you're in? All right, good. 
So what we're going to do, I'm going to give you a couple minutes to talk to the people in your group in just a second. What I'm going to ask your group members to do in the next four minutes is quickly say hello, quickly talk about a couple things that you're like, ooh, if we make a, uh, a ballot right now, I'd really like to see this particular item on the ballot. So I'm going to give you guys a chance to, one, say a quick hi and talk about a few things you'd like to see. If you think that the thing that you guys really want to see is not on the map yet, take a moment to jot that down so you can throw it up there. It's okay for us to add more ideas to the map right now. So again, you guys are going to be my budget delegates. We're getting ready to develop proposals. Before we do that, I want you guys to know who your team members are. When I stop talking, you guys are going to say a quick hello, and then think about Mm, is there any idea that I didn't jot down earlier that I really want to make sure is up on one of these maps? I'll give you guys about five minutes to do that, a 30-second warning, and then I'll pull you back to tell you what's going to happen next. Ready? Begin. So you should have had a chance to say a quick hello. Now is your chance to write down any ideas that you want to make sure you get up on the Yeah. 
I also tried to drink some deep rose here. Yeah. Some of my got made. I don't think we'll have a story. Uh, oh, okay. It's <laughs> just So now I want you guys to divide even more in probably groups of three or four. And I'm trusting you a lot to figure this out. So in groups of three or four, what I'd like you guys to do is say hi to now your much smaller group of three or four people. You guys together in your team of three or four are going to walk up to one of these maps here and pick off an idea that you are going to develop further into a full project proposal. Let me show you what this project proposal is going to look like. The first thing you're going to do when you pick up your post-it note is pick a project that you're really excited about. Ideally, you're going to pick one that's not yours. You're going to work on another idea that someone else in this room came up with. So try to do that for me. I'm not going to police you, though. The first thing you're going to do when you get that project is think really hard on how to make it super cool. You're going to come up with a really badass title for this project, one that everyone's going to love. And then you're going to give me a little visual. You're going to draw it out for me. What is it going to look like? If you're talking about building a community garden, you might explain a little bit of that here in a very visual way. And then you're going to raise your hand or scream out to me, because we're going to start talking about how much this is going to cost after you explain to me, the staff member for the city in this exercise, what your project is going to look like. You'll jot down a super quick description, and then you'll say a couple words on why this project is important and needed and feasible in this community. Does that sound okay? 
I expect some really beautiful drawings. You guys see the art that was already on the room, so I, I have really high standards here. Does anyone have any questions for clarity before I start dividing you guys off to do this work? Okay. So in just a few moments, again, you guys will divide into groups of three or four. You'll walk up to the maps. You'll look at an idea that you're going to develop even further. You'll pull that idea off. You'll come down and grab a project proposal sheet, and you'll start filling in this proposal. When your team is ready for the cost estimate, you'll flag me over, and then we'll talk about how much it's going to cost. Make sure that your project is at, is at least under a million dollars, but over $25,000. And don't worry, I'll help you if you guys get stuck. You guys ready? Give me a thumbs up. And begin. We gotta find We gotta find I don't know. I passed Yeah, we're transit-oriented teams. Transit-oriented teams. That's good. Uh, Jack, you're only team left. <laughs> Damn, you're still 19, bro? No. <laughs>
look out for the person that stands in front of your poster because you should relieve them so that they also have a chance to check out the rest of the projects. Does this sound okay? Thumbs up if you like it. All right, so what's gonna happen now is I'm gonna give you guys just five, uh, 10 minutes to put those projects up. Make sure you have a representative in front of it and so that you guys can all check out all the projects. At the end of this, I'll give everyone an opportunity to vote. Don't vote now because you don't know how to vote yet, right? So put all your projects up and then we'll begin our expo now. Sell it.
spend much amount of time. So 6 a.m. is the general. Early morning travel as well to late evening. Yeah, we just did it here. this one.
fall of the boats. And while that's happening, and you guys, if you tally up the boats, just let me know um, on each side the top three and the cost. Write it down on a piece of paper and bring it up to me. The top three and the cost. I'll need the title of the project, the cost. The top three that you see on each side. Tell me how many boats it got, the title, and the cost. Now, while folks are doing that, I have some questions for you guys. Um, we're going to get a chance to debrief and hang out and mix and mingle, but I want to know, what did you think? What were the things when we went through this process that stuck out to you? Um, and, what, and what are the things that you thought, hmm, this might be pretty cool to, if I gave this a try? What were the things that stuck out to you? And what were the things that you thought, hmm, this might be pretty cool if we gave this a try? Case 
Because if this were to happen in a real PD process, this is when we'd go back to the rule book that the steering committee wrote. And we would determine what they decided on the front end of the process. This is something that totally takes place, but we have two projects that are in a tie and we have to decide what to do. So sometimes what we do is partially fund both. Sometimes what we do is adapt both projects so that they're under budget. But no matter what, that doesn't happen on the end of this process. It's incredibly transparent. We have that conversation on the front end. Sometimes what happens is as we start knocking off our winning projects and the pot of funds becomes allocated to a smaller and smaller amount that we have remaining, we see a little bit of a remainder. In Boston, we funded five projects, and then we had $80,000 left. It wasn't enough to fund the full project that had the next number of votes. So what we did instead was go back to the steering committee and ask them, what are we going to do? Would you like us to partially fund another project, or would you like to hold on to this reserve in case there are construction costs that we didn't anticipate that we can then use with this remaining pot of funds? They were super smart and savvy. They determined we're actually going to use this fund, these funds, to improve the other three projects, or the other four projects that already went on the ballot. So, you guys, I appreciate you spending so much time with me. I know today is the first day back from spring break. So even to have you guys in the building means a lot to me. I really appreciate you all. Thanks so much. Let's have some pizza, hang out, and chat a bit. Appreciate it, guys. All right. Uh, one more time, let's say thanks to Sherry. And there's food up here, uh, pizza of different varieties. Join us for a little bit of a dinner. We're just going to set up in here.